welcome back to Sierra Foothills. This video is going to be about tree trimming. Um, we have a lot of trees on the property and it requires a lot of upkeep for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the appearance of the trees, the health of the trees, the appearance of the property, that sort of thing. I worked in the residential tree service for 10 years of my life, so it's a subject that I'm pretty well versed in. Um, the video that you will see of the tree trimming was shot uh, actually last weekend and the weekend before. So, but um, I'm gonna frame the video with a beginning and an end and also uh, a few scenes interspersing the actual tree trimming. So hopefully it's informative and entertaining to you, um, but there's a lot of work to do, so let's get started. People named Rick have been instrumental in my life. Of course, there's my, this is too low. There's my brother, Rick. And then in the tree industry, I worked with two guys that were really incredible workers and people. I learned a lot from both of them. Uh, one of them is no longer in the tree business. Well, neither of them are. The one who taught me how to tree climb and taught me a lot of things um, has retired to his life as a chainsaw artist. And he has a nice little business in Western New York uh, making chainsaw carvings. And the other one, um, who I worked with for about 10 years at the um, tree service. Uh, moved on to become a equipment operator and to drive truck for uh, New York State Department of uh, Transportation. So, and he taught me a ton about a lot of different things. So, um, yep, yeah, it's always easy to think about those guys uh, when you're doing tree work because it's like a lot of things in you know, work situations where you spend more time with the people at work than you do with your own family and uh, and both Rick and Rick were awesome people to hang out with have fun with and work with even though we were working our asses off um, it was hard work but it was fun spending time with those guys think about them often So the first trees that I trimmed on the property were these three trees here, um, the island trees next to the house. Uh, this one here, and the previous owner put a support cable in there so it wouldn't split. Um, I put actually a threaded rod in here uh, because it was showing signs of weakness in the main crotch and it would have been horrible to lose this tree uh, because it gives us westerly shade. Uh, we're facing east right now, it shades us in the afternoon and as I mentioned, it gets very hot here. So this was the first tree that I trimmed when we moved here. And then these other two oak trees um, were trimmed during that same time period. And then this manzanita tree as well.
This tree here was infested with mistletoe. And so I spent about six hours climbing this tree. And if you know anything about mistletoe, it typically happens at the very, very ends of branches. Um, and so it was on the very ends of the uh, twigs of the tree. And so I had to climb virtually the entire tree, every square inch of this tree to chase out probably about 40 or 50 bundles of mistletoe. The parasite, which eventually can kill a tree. Um, and so this is a big specimen tree. It's in the middle of the yard. And uh, there's the island trees. This little guy here I did trim also. Um, most of the trees we trimmed were around the house or had to do with curb appeal. So we wanted them to look good. I haven't made a decision on whether to keep this manzanita or not. I think by law, I have no choice. I believe that they're protected, so I guess we'll keep it. And then recently we trimmed these trees here at the front of the driveway. Uh, one of them is live oak on the left, it's evergreen, and then the other one uh, is an oak tree also, but it, uh, it's dormant right now. Trim that one, trim that one, and I have to trim uh, this group here on the approach to the house. So this is the oak tree with the hanging basket chairs. Um, you can see a pruning cut here that I made and you can see it was a, a good cut because you can see the callus tissue forming around where this dead branch used to be. And it will eventually heal over. Um, if we go down here, here's an example of a pretty good pruning cut that has healed over completely. It's impervious now to uh, any sort of uh, infections or pests. So uh, if you make your proper if you make your pruning cuts properly, they will heal over over time. Um, but most people who don't know how to cut trees either cut them uh, too close or not close enough. So here is, um, yeah, you can see once again, the so-called callus tissue forming here. And so, um, yeah, this is a tree that we want to uh, trim up pretty soon here. You can see where these branches were just crudely hacked off. Um, they weren't trimmed back to any sort of good live growth where the uh, growth hormones could redirect. And so um, the problem with dead wood is it becomes uh, punky and dried out and then wet and spongy. It just becomes an entry port for uh, bacterial or fungal or viral diseases, all of which will affect trees. Um, and so, you know, you can argue that the entirety of this dead limb here is because poor cuts were made over here. So, uh, ditto with this guy over here. So, you know, this tree is a lower priority tree, but it will eventually have to be trimmed because there is a ton of dead wood on it and we don't want to lose this tree. So, so a word on proper tree trimming. This is the trunk here and you're going up into the crown and so on and so forth. But what most amateurs and some supposed professionals don't understand is uh, I showed you the branch that was just cut off here and the whole branch died. Uh, if you don't cut this close enough back to the tree, uh, this will die and it'll just become more or less dry rotted or wet rotted out and it'll be an entry port for any sort of pathogens, viral, fungal, or bacterial, or, you know, pest, insect, carpenter ants, termites, whatever. So there's an active layer of cells here, and I showed you the proper pruning cuts. You want to take it right back there to what we call the branch collar, and that will allow callus tissue to form and close up over that exposed wood. 
In addition to cutting it too long and not cutting back to the branch collar, some people flush the branch off here and you've done the same thing. You've eliminated any callusing that the tree can do. You've basically made an open wound on the tree and that will uh, never heal over and cause the tree to be very, very susceptible uh, to any pathogens, um, anything of that um, type. So there's a sweet spot anytime you make a pruning cut and it's right where you can kind of see the branch taking on its own form. It's called the branch collar and that's where you want to be. You don't want to be here and you don't want to be here when you're cutting. Uh, in addition, you want to cut your first cut there because this will hinge down and sometimes tear the tree and you don't want to tear the bark off. So you make a first cut and then you make a finish cut. The other fundamental to uh, tree trimming, we just went over the removal of branches, um, and then there is the shortening of branches. Um, I guess you can call it trimming. So you might not want to move, or remove rather, an entire branch. You might just want to shorten it, okay? And so the fundamental for that, once again, there's, it's a two cut thing. You make your first cut, and you make your finish cut. The finish cut is supposed to be made at a lateral. If you can see, this is kind of a main branch here. And this is a subsidiary or secondary branch. If you're going to trim this main branch back, you're going to make the first cut, and then you're going to make a finish cut back to the lateral so that what you're left with is here. And the tree will continue to grow. This will heal over, and there will still be a viable... Um, shoot on this tree. Um, so that's how you cut back a limb. Like if this was, for instance, growing over the house and you had to shorten this limb, you would cut it back to a lateral. Similarly, on this one, if this was going out, say, over your garage or you just didn't want it there, too much shade or whatever, uh, you would make your first cut, get rid of it, and then you make your finish cut back to this lateral branch here. And then you will have um, the callusing and the healing of the tree here, and the callusing and the healing of the tree here. Those are how you make um, proper pruning cuts. And it's really, really simple. But most people don't know how to do it. But now, you do. These are two trees which will be trimmed pretty soon. Um, they will receive special attention. The one on the left, I just love it. It's real. It's got that spooky, crazy oak look. Um, branches going in all different directions. And then this one is really quite the opposite. It's a beautifully formed tree. It's got a very wide spread. It's actually wider than it is tall. Um, it has the boulder at the base of it. Um, our friend Eileen gave us a, sw a swing that I want to put in there. It'll be a nice place with the boulders here, the boulders there. Maybe uh, plant some daffodils or something there and just make it a nice little rest spot. So these trees uh, need to be trimmed because there's a fair amount of dead wood that I'd like to clean out of there.
each time you disassemble uh, to service and clean your chainsaw, you want to take the bar, you want to flip it. Um, the reason is because the motion of the chain is um, in one direction always, and there's certain mechanical biases um, that will cause the bar to wear unevenly. So by flipping the bar each time you service it, um, you will prolong the life of your bar because you will um, make sure that it's wearing evenly or as evenly as possible. day two of the tree work and I ended up not climbing. There was too much cleaning up to do and particularly raking um, because most of the limbs that were removed from this oak were dead limbs so when they hit the ground they shattered into a million pieces of course. So I've spent probably about three hours limbing, separating viable firewood from brush that will be chipped. Um, I don't want to burn it unless as a last resort there's a fire safe council here that will come and chip. They're not really reliable as far as when they show up and when they get it done, but I'm gonna have them chip it into a pile for us so we can continue to spread wood chips on the property. Here's some more brush piles. You'll notice that the cut ends are facing the driveway so that they can be fed through a chipper more easily. Um, anyone who knows anything about brush piles for chipping knows that they should all face in one direction for ease of chipping and also just dragging. If you form a brush pile over there and you drag it 30 feet, if the ends are in one direction, typically uh, it's easier to drag. Kind of reminds me of an old joke about two hunters uh, dragging a, um, a deer through the woods. Uh, same principle if you're familiar with that joke. Punchline to that joke, by the way, is, yeah, that guy was right. This works a lot better. But well, we're getting awfully far from the truck. real carefully you won't see a single straight stick in this pile so this is going to be firewood um, these oaks um, you can see they don't grow straight nothing about these are typically straight it's hard to get a usable log out of them um, so there are things that you can use crooked logs for um, a lot of the bushcraft skills require um, crooked logs like this, crooked branches, you can make um, hooks and handles and things like that. The one thing you can't make with wood like this is you can't really build uh, dwelling structures, barns, things like that with them. So, um, you know, in a lot of different parts of the world you get straight logs coming out of the woods, but around here, uh, not so much. The, you'll find a lot straight log here and there, but it's few and far between. First world problems, I know. In the 10 years before we bought this property, uh, nine of those 10 years were drought years here in California. And the amount of tree mortality was uh, extreme. So in the 10 acres here, there's actually a lot of dead trees and a lot of dead wood. So really, um, 
there's some duty to go in there and clean out the fuel to prevent wildfire risk. Um, so that will get done eventually, but um, for many reasons, the priorities are by the house. Um, they want you to have 100 feet of defensible space because they're really, firefighters are really only interested in protecting structures. So um, you first have to trim and remove trees near the house. And then if they're near the house, obviously there's a curb appeal aspect to it too. So that's another reason why you trim the trees by the house. Over time, once all the specimen trees and the important prominent trees on the property are trimmed, um, we will head down the property towards the creek and start cleaning out the woods and getting a lot of the fuel out of there, removing the dead trees, large dead limbs, and scrub growth in there. There's about two dozen ravens flying around here. I don't know why, what got them stirred up. They'll commonly gang up on a hawk, but I don't see a hawk over there. They seem to be dispersing now. I wish I'd gotten my camera out a bit sooner. But it was an airborne disturbance. get the idea. Uh, tree work is really hard work. I don't know if you can tell, um, but we've been visited by inclement weather. Um, it's raining outside now and um, you know on that subject when we were in the residential tree service we didn't mind the occasional uh, rain day. Give your body a chance to rest up and recover. Um, when you're doing hard manual labor consecutive days in a row during the dog days of summer it's, um, it's a war of attrition. It's really tough and uh, good training also but uh, we always uh, didn't mind, or we never minded, um, the occasional reprieve from Mother Nature. So, you know, the rain has come. I'm taking shelter here. This is an appropriate time to shut down the video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it, and I hope you'll join us again on Sierra Foothills. <laughs>